Good evening and welcome to worship. Would you join with me in singing our first hymn of the evening? It came upon the midnight clear, hymn number 93. Would you stand, please? You may be seated. Well, good evening and welcome to Neal's Creek Baptist Church for our Christmas Eve candlelight service. This is a special tradition for our church. And if this is your first time joining us on Christmas Eve, we are so glad that you have chosen to spend this special time with us this evening. You know, Christmas Eve is a night of anticipation. We eagerly await all of the good things that we know will happen tomorrow on Christmas Day. We anticipate getting up early to see presents under the tree. We look forward to being with friends and family and loved ones. We can't wait to taste those special home-cooked dishes and many of the family recipes that have been passed down through generations of our family. The four Sundays of Advent have built our anticipation as we get closer and closer and we're almost there to Christmas Day. Tonight we remember events that took place over 2,000 years ago in the little town of Bethlehem. A young couple engaged to be married were eagerly expecting the arrival of their child, searching earnestly for a place that they might lay their head and have some rest before Mary went into childbirth, went into labor. They were looking for anywhere that would be sanitary and suitable where she might give birth. 
to her firstborn son. But no such place was found. Instead, Mary and Joseph ducked into a cattle barn where she gave birth and wrapped her baby in bands of cloth and lay him in a manger of straw. And there are many reasons to be excited for Christmas Day and to look forward to its coming each year. But the greatest reason for our anticipation, for our celebration, must always be the birth of this child. The, all the other worldly aspects of our celebration mean nothing if we don't make room for Jesus to be born anew in our lives. He was the promised Messiah. He is the Savior of all mankind. And He rules as the King of kings. And the Bible says that we as Christians should celebrate Christmas believing that just as surely as Christ came to Bethlehem 2,000 years ago and was born in that manger, that one day He will come back again to gather His people and to reign with righteousness and justice forevermore. So would you join with me in prayer? God, we praise You tonight the giver of every good and perfect gift, and we worship you knowing that the greatest gift of all was your Son, Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer. So tonight, gracious God, we pray for four things. This Christmas, we pray for hope. Hope for a world that's lost in sin and walking in darkness. Hope for broken families and those bound by addiction. Hope for those that feel buried under a mountain of debt. Hope for those who are weak in their bodies and see no better day on the horizon. We ask not simply for a hope that comes when we know that good things are about to happen, but for a hope that anchors us even when we hang on for dear life. This Christmas we pray for peace. We pray for safety for our brothers and sisters worshiping tonight and tomorrow, both here in America and around the world. We pray for the peace that comes only from having Jesus in our hearts. We pray for for peace in our families where strife and pain and division are all too often real. We pray for peace in our communities where drugs and crime and violence seem to be so prevalent. We pray for peace in our nation that seems to be so polarized by political agendas and needless dysfunction. We pray for peace on planet Earth to save us from wars and terror. We pray for a peace that is not simply the absence of conflict, but a peace that passes understanding, a peace that comes through Jesus Christ that guards our hearts and our minds so that we might even forgive our enemies, let go of the past, keep no record of wrongs, and turn all earthly situations over to you, God, knowing that you work and redeem all things together for our good. This Christmas we pray for joy, not simply a joy that we experience when everything is going our way, but a joy that is like a deep well within us that never runs dry. We pray for the joy that comes from giving instead of receiving, the joy that comes from putting a smile on someone else's face, the joy that keeps a song in our heart and a word of praise on our tongue. We pray for the joy to seek life and proclaim God's favor in all circumstances. And we pray that this joy of the Lord will keep our bodies healthy, our spirits whole, and our souls bold for the kingdom of God. This Christmas we pray for love, unconditional love. We pray for the love of God to heal the hurts of the human race, to forgive all our sins, to make all things new. We pray for the love of God that was made known to us through Jesus Christ, the Son. The love that left heaven and came to earth in the flesh. The love that was embodied in His teachings and demonstrated in His actions. A love that healed sick children and delivered those possessed by demons. A love that spoke truth to power, that stood up for what was right. And demonstrated mercy for the last, the least, and the lost. We pray for that same unconditional love that led him to the cross, the love that suffered on Calvary, the love that raised him from the dead. We pray for the power of your eternal love, that it might transform each of us and turn our chaos into your perfect creation. 
Oh God, we praise you for the good news of Christmas that is for all people. Hear our Christmas prayer in the name of Jesus, the promised Messiah, our soon coming King. Amen. Tonight is the night we've been waiting for, when our waiting is transformed into awestruck wonder at what God has done. We celebrate Jesus coming into this world as we light all five candles. The first candle reminds us of the ultimate hope that comes through our Savior's birth. The second candle beckons us to the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. The third candle invites us to share the joy of the shepherds and angels in announcing our Savior's birth. The fourth candle reminds us of the good news of great joy and to tales of God's love that is stronger than the bonds of human sin. And the Christ candle reminds us that from the moment he took his very first breath until the day of his glorious return, Jesus says to each of us, Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Let us join together and respond on this Christmas Eve. Will you join me on the bold printed text in your bulletin? Tonight we celebrate the moment, the one birth, and the one life that forever changed the world. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Because you came to us, we have experienced the ultimate hope to combat even the darkest moments. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Because you came to us, we have seen the fullness of love to the highest degree. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Because you came to us, we have seen the face of peace in its purest form. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Tonight, we celebrate your birth 
that unleashes hope, love, peace, and joy into the world from now until the day of your return. O come, O come, Emmanuel. I'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 35. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the humps where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And the highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast get up on it. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Let us join together this evening singing Away in a Manger, hymn number 103. Would you stand, please? come down for a Christmas story tonight.
Well, I'm sure everyone is super excited for what might be coming tomorrow. But last Sunday, you may have received a gift from Miss Carol that I left you. You may have received a camel, and that camel's name was Caleb, and he had a special story because he took a special journey. And so that Caleb is to go with tonight. This is a star for me. At Christmas, some might start counting their gifts under the tree, but do you think to count your blessings too? Do we think to count our blessings as our gifts? And we're going to learn about a camel named Oli. So a star for me. Our story begins with a star in the sky. It's the brightest, said Oli. And I wonder why. I think it's a new star. Don't you agree? Since I saw it first, I think it's for me. His mother replied, it could be for you, but it might be for all of the rest of us too. Then his dad said, it's a big, and it's a bright, and by far, it could be bringing a blessing. So let's go find that star. So who do we think it was for last time? Yeah, it's that new star. Then Oli's big family marched into the night to follow the new star that shone oh so bright. Mothers and fathers, aunts, uncles, and cousins, a long line of camels, dozens and dozens. I might be the youngest, small, Oliver said, but I'm not afraid, so let's see what's ahead. Oli felt blessed. He felt safe as could be, protected and cared for by his family. The farther they went, the excitement was growing, and Oli was ready to get his legs going. He ran on ahead and jumped with a dance. I can't wait to get there. He said with a prance, Dear God, I'm thankful for ears that can wiggle, for lips that can pucker, and bellies that jiggle, for legs that can gallop and jumble and mosey, and thanks for each hair and each footsie and toesie. Who's that in the camel's blessing? They went on their way. They were halfway there when Oli's dad said, I have a secret to share. These men traveling with us are so very wise, and I've heard them speak of an awesome surprise. We're heading to Bethlehem, a little town, to find a great gift that God has sent down. A surprise, said Oli. What could it be? Did God send a gift down from heaven for me? Oli felt hungry. His tummy rumbled. I want ice cream and cookies and candy, he grumbled. But his mother knew best. She knew what he needed. Eat all your straw now, sweet boy mother pleaded. Straw is the healthiest, best camel food. And so Oli ate it. He chewed and he chewed. And the straw tasted good. It made him feel strong. He was ready to go. And the star kept moving along. In a while they stopped. And those wise men got down to ask for directions at a nearby town. A girl from the town gave Oli a hug. Sweet camel, she gushed. You're as cute as a bug. Oli blushed as shy as could be. Oh, please, he whispered. Please stop hugging me. Hugs, his mother, are sweet gifts of love. Another good thing sent to you from above. Oh, look, said Oli. Look up at the star. It's moving. Let's go. I know we, where we are. Dear God, Oli prayed, what could it be that you have in Bethlehem waiting for me? Could it be a gift wrapped in paper and bows? Inside, is it a puzzle, a game, I suppose? I can't wait to see with my very own eyes just what you have planned as a special surprise. When they got to the town, the star stopped in the sky. It shone on a stable, and Oli thought, why? Then Oliver heard a wise man say, God gave us his son. It's a wonderful day. Inside a stable where animals live, lay baby Jesus in a straw-filled crib. The stable was quiet, and the stable was still. 
Not a word, not a moo, not a quack or a trill. Ollie peeked in the babe in the straw. He looked with his wonder, and then he saw, where the starlight lit up Jesus' sweet little face. God had spread love all over the place. Then Oli knit down in the animal stall. He said, Jesus, you are the best blessing of all. Now you've probably guessed, as you followed the star, God sent Jesus for everyone right where they are. So our greatest gift and our blessing, what do you think it was? They journeyed far, a weary pair. They sought for shelter from the cold night air. Some place where she could lay her head, where she could give her babe a quiet bed. Was there no room for the Savior? And do you seek him? Have you a place for the one who lived and died for you? Are you as humble as a shepherd boy or as wise as men of old? Would you have come that night? Would you have sought the light? Do you have room? A star arose, a wondrous light, a sign from God this was the holy night. And yet so few would go to see the babe who came to rescue you and me. This child divine is now a king. The gift of life to all the world he brings. And all mankind he saves from doom. But on that night for him there was no room. Do you have room for the Savior? And do you seek him anew? Have you a place for the one who lived and died for you? Are you as humble as a shepherd boy or as wise as men of old? Would you? Would you have sought the light? Do you have room? Will you come tonight? 
Thank you, Sarah. I want to share with you the first five verses of Revelation chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there any more, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will be no more night. They need no light or of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, how lovely are your branches. That's a song we hear this time of year, one maybe that we sing around a family gathering. It reminds us that one of the most central parts of our Christmas tradition is putting up a Christmas tree. Now, for many of us, picking out just the right tree, putting it up, lighting it, decorating it, putting presents underneath it, uh, all of that is uh, a rather ornate ritual. You're just not ready for Christmas until you've got your tree up and decorated. But everyone does it just a little bit differently. Some people go and put their tree up right after Thanksgiving, some even before. Some wait until Christmas Eve, till late this afternoon and buy a tree on sale and then put it up and leave it up for the 12 days of Christmas. Uh, I even saw on Facebook one family, Burt Walker and his family, they have a tradition where they go out uh, today on Christmas Eve and they try to find the loneliest, most forlorn, pitiful-looking Christmas tree that nobody else wants and everyone else has overlooked, and they take it and give it a home. I think Burt's just trying to get a free Christmas tree out of the deal. But that's their tradition. Some go to a Christmas tree farm, like in the North Carolina mountains, and look for that perfect tree and have it cut fresh and bring it live to their home. Others have an old, faithful, artificial tree that has served them well for many seasons, and they bring it out of the attic or the closet, put it back into action for this time of year. Some people prefer a lavishly decorated tree that is a centerpiece of their home. Others prefer a small, simple tree. Some believe in using family ornaments, perhaps even a homemade ornament. Some people do an old-timey Christmas tree where they string popcorn and gumdrops on, while others decorate their trees according to a theme, such as our angel tree here in the sanctuary. Some believe in using only clear lights, while others use lights of all colors that pulsate and chase all over the tree. Some families have only one Christmas tree. Other families have a tree in every room of a house. Our traditions involving our Christmas tree or trees are as unique as each of our personalities. This year, Melissa and I had a time with our Christmas tree. We went to the farmer's market. We picked out a beautiful Fraser fir. We brought it home, put it in our living room, got it in the tree stand, and I put 1,200 lights on it, only to have it fall over twice before she ever put the first ornament on there. So for the next uh, week that followed, we tried to make that tree behave, uh, but we finally had to just put it out in the backyard where I could anchor it, rig it up, redneck style with some wire to make it stand up. So we have a backyard tree this year, an outside tree, and we have just an artificial tree in our den where the presents are under. But the Christmas tree has become a part of our celebration of Christmas because it is an evergreen tree, meaning that it stays green year-round. That's why we use in our decorations for Christmas green garland, green wreaths, green trees, because green reminds us of things that are eternal, everlasting life. 
reminds us of God's greatest gift to humanity, the gift of eternal life through the Son of God, Jesus Christ our Savior. Another reason that we use Christmas trees is because there are three important trees in the Bible. Now, you may have never noticed it or paid much attention to it. Most people haven't, even Christians who know their Bible well. But there are three distinct trees in the Bible. One in the beginning, one in the Gospels, and one that we just read about at the very end. And these three trees summarize for us the entire message of the Bible. If you wanted to explain to someone who had never read a single verse of Scripture what the Bible says, give them a broad uh, summary, uh, understanding of sin, salvation, and sanctification, you could do it using these three trees. The first tree is found in Genesis 2, where God told Adam and Eve, you may eat freely of, of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. So this first tree is a tree containing the knowledge of good and evil. A tree that contains a curse of death. A tree that uh, bore forbidden fruit. And it became the downfall of this tree. Through this tree, Adam and Eve were enticed by the serpent to disobey God, to forsake his commands, to eat of its fruit, and commit the first sin. And what happened when sin entered the perfection of the Garden of Eden is that all of creation became cursed with sin as a result. And every generation born after Adam, all of humanity would be born into a cursed world. Isaiah 53, 6 put it this way. He said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have each turned to our own way. Paul said it this way in Romans 3, 23. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. On some level, we have all eaten of that forbidden fruit, haven't we? We've all disobeyed God. We've all broken his commands. We've all been bent toward our own desires. We're all prone to wander from the truth because of that first tree. God and humanity have been separated by this tree called sin. When Adam and Eve were banished from the garden, we're told, the eternal paradise they had with God was over after they ate of that tree and had that fruit. In the book of Genesis, it tells you that life is hard for us, that creation is broken and cursed, that we live in a world of darkness and evil and death because of that first tree of that original sin. But then in the Gospels, we read about the second tree. It was a tree that sat atop a hill shaped like a skull. It was not a living tree, but rather it was wood taken from a tree that was used to make horrific instruments of torture and execution. Jesus carried this tree on his back, collapsing under its exhausting weight. When he reached the top of the skull-shaped hill called Golgotha, he was nailed to that tree. You may have sung those words in the hymn that we sing on Good Friday, Were You There When They Crucified Your Lord? The second verse adds, Were You There When They Nailed Him to the Cross? Two nails were each in his hands, one nail through his feet. After suffering for hours, there he died an agonizing death, hung high on stretched wire for trying to get through. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, He who knew no sin became sin for our sake in order that we might become the righteousness of God. The second tree represents God's solution for the problem of sin separating us from God. The cross became a bridge of reconciliation between a holy God and a sinful humanity. The cross where Jesus paid the price that you and I could not pay. Romans 6.23 tells us that the price of our sin is death and eternal separation from God, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrated his love for us in this fact, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the first tree created this problem of sin, but the second tree, the cross of Calvary, created
made it a way by which our sin could be forgiven and we could be reconciled to God and have relationship with him for all eternity. And that brings us to the third and final tree found in Revelation 21. The tree we just read about called the tree of life. John is shown a vision in Revelation 22 where he is escorted by an angel all around the holy city, the new Jerusalem. John sees a river of crystal clear water flowing through the middle of the city, the kind of water that Jesus said if the human soul drinks of it, he'll never thirst again. That water flows down from the throne of God and meanders its way through the middle of the holy city As we prepare to enter into a time of lighting our candles, let us sing together, Silent Night, Holy Night, hymn number 91. Would you stand, please? Mm -hmm. 